When the world has got you down and Alzheimer's sucks. It's an equal opportunity disease that chips away at everything we hold dear. And to date, there's no cure. So until there is, we continue to fight with the most powerful tool in our arsenal, love. This is Love Conquers Alls, a real and really positive podcast that takes a deep dive into everything Alzheimer's, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And now, here are your hosts, Susie Singer-Carter and me, Don Priest. Hello, I'm Susie Singer-Carter. And I'm Don Priest, and this is Love Conquers Alls. Hello, Susan. Hello, Donald. I've lost my brain. <laughs> it's gone. I, I think have... right now, in fact, if we can get through this episode without, um, I don't know, exploding, <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think it's a win. I think it's I think great. it's a win, too. Yeah. We are, <laughs> we are, we are, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel on our, on our um, documentary, No Country for Old People. We are, um, we've been working so hard, which is why we haven't had, you know, our, our signature two episodes a month of Love Conquers Alls, because it, w- we literally couldn't, we can't. So we have to really pare down over the last couple months and probably the next few coming months, you know, but, but nevertheless, we're still here and we're still so happy that you've joined us and that you're listening to us and that you, you continue to support because I think that, you know, albeit there's a lot of uh, podcasts to listen to and especially now during, you know, with care in the caregiving arena, but I think all of everybody's brings something different and I hope that, you know, we bring something that's a little more, you know, positive and um, uh, a, a better as, a aspect in a way to destigma, stigmify, destigma, destigmatize. Let's try that you. again. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. A way to destigmatize. Our first, ex, our first explosion. Yeah. Boom. There. Boom. <laughs> this is what happens on no sleep. So, um, yeah. And we just, we really want to be able to do that, not just for Alzheimer's, but for you know, all, all diseases that we as caregivers have to deal with. Because at the end of the day, we are, we're doing the same thing. It doesn't matter whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's, it's you know, MS or ALS or, or Parkinson's like our guest today. Right, Don? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it is because there are similarities. I think no matter what the, uh, the disease is, and sometimes it's a physical, sometimes it's a mental, sometimes it's a combination thereof, there's going to be consistencies that we as caregivers all need to share with each other. And that's why we're here. And, uh, you know, but uh, just, just to, um, you know, anything new going on in life, I know there's been some exciting things with your daughters recently that you've, uh, <laughs> you've experienced because they, they both, we just saw them perform recently, both of them in different venues. It was amazing. No, they're following in my footsteps. They're, that's so wrong. But they, <laughs> no, my, my, my younger daughter performed, uh, with, with, one, with her group, um, and, and did a tribute to a song that I recorded with Chuck Lorre, the Chuck Lorre of, uh, of, of, you know, sitcom fame, who was producing me as, as a teenager in a group called Two Chicks. And, um, and my daughter was very much, you know, it's, it's very uh, retro now. It's a, it was an 80s video song called um, uh, Bad Dreams in Hollywood. And they did a tribute to it. And it was phenomenal. I felt so old. <laughs> <laughs> But it was but amazing. It was fun. Yeah. yeah, it was really fun. It was fun to hear them, and they were just like everybody coming up. Oh my God, that we saw the video. We're like, love it. It's like so cool, and you just feel <laughs> you feel like you know, very very honored. It was very honored, and um, yeah, that's it. My daughter, do- my other daughter, just did a an incredible uh, chorale for a Christmas a Christmas concert here in Los Angeles, which was phenomenal. She's got a voice like an angel, like my mom's. And um, I'm just uh, very proud. I cried like my like my mom used to. I'd always say, well, "Mom, why are you crying?" Now I know I cry. So <laughs> anyway, but let's let's introduce our guest. Okay, I think we can do that. 
Today, our guest is Dr. George Ackerman, and he dedicates himself to law, policing, and education. But on the first day of the year 2020, Dr. Ackerman faced the loss of his beloved mother, Sharon Riff Ackerman, to the relentless progression of Parkinson's disease. In honor of his mother's memory and to contribute meaningfully to the Parkinson's awareness movement, Together for Sharon was conceived. It's a heartfelt initiative founded not only to preserve the cherished memory of his mother, but also to shine a light and further the message on Parkinson's awareness and the ongoing hope for a cure. TogetherForSharon.com now extends its reach across the nation, becoming a beacon of awareness for Parkinson's disease. And he is here today to bring that message to us. So let's welcome Dr. George Ackerman. Hello, George. I thank both of you and, and all your viewers for your time and the dogs. And the, and the dogs. We, we, <laughs> of yeah, we welcome them. They're part we of actually, the show. <laughs> actually, if you go to that website, togetherforsharing.com, and scroll down, you'll see our little yellow, uh, uh, it's Bella, the love, we call it the love doodle, but it's a little, <laughs> uh, she's our mascot, so <laughs> it's perfect Oh, timing. my gosh. <laughs> what kind of dog is she? The golden doodle, my son. Oh, my one God. Of them, uh, allergic, the best. So. <laughs> Yeah. The best. Oh, my God. I love. Yep. You can't have better. Listen, it's so great to have you here. We finally did it, George. And, um, you know, like I was saying in the intro about caregivers and, it, and I, th- you know, because you think why our show is Love Conquers Alls. But I don't think that matters because when I when I learned your story and and, you know, the story of, of your beloved mother, Sharon, and I feel I felt so, such uh, a kismet to you because I felt like I've, I've gone through such a similar journey, although the details might be different, but the emotional journey is the same. And um, my mom was my favorite person in the whole world, too. And so I totally understand, I, I, I understand that loss and, and the, uh, the frustration of not being able to fix the problem and so how to lean into it, which is what you did, and, and, the, and, and to continue to honor your mother is just a beautiful thing, right? And I, I love that, and that's what I hope that I'm doing with this show and with all of the projects that I've done, you know, to, to, to make sense of what they've gone through. And so can you tell us, I, for the audience, about a little bit about how this all started for you. I believe it was a long journey like mine. Sorry to hear about your loss, too. Uh, like I Thank said, I, my dream is to have a cure someday for all of these diseases. Uh, I found myself really a sense of uh, being alone when it happened. Uh, you don't train or plan for being a caretaker, especially when your mother or any loved one's your best friend. I mean, I spoke to her about 10, t- 10 times a day, uh, and uh, I might be 6'2", and 200 pounds law enforcement, but I become a softie when I'm with my mother or talking about her. But it started about 15 years before 2020. She had Parkinson's, but she was the type of independent woman who didn't want to tell anyone else about her issues, which is kind of sad because I wish she did, and not that we could have done anything different, but maybe we could have treated her a little you know, better. But she, I found out, uh, so for many years, like several she lived a normal, independent life. She lived on her own. She drove. She shopped. But she had a little loss of her ability to use her left arm, like a stiffness. And so we were able to still all kind of live without any huge life challenges. And her struggles, though, continued, and she kind of hid them, which was another issue for another podcast that I wish we would talk about, about how people might not want to share you know, their diagnosis with individuals or maybe don't want to talk about it because in a sad way they're ashamed, but they have to realize that they have love and support and that we're all here, you know, together to help fight any of these diseases. So uh, to fast forward a little, 2020, 1 1 2020, she passed. But the last uh, two, three years were very tough. The last seven days were something I can never even describe uh, to you. She didn't really live, she just had a heartbeat. Florida, where I'm located, doesn't have the Death with Dignity Act. So basically, the last three years, it was just like, as a human being or loved one, I felt uh, there was just one thing after another. After, every time I thought of an idea that maybe it could help, it just got crushed and destroyed. And then it was just felt like building blocks, like you're walking up the steps and you keep going backwards. So that's kind of what, you know, that, what happened. Her health deteriorated. 
they say there's five stages of Parkinson's. The fifth was really the worst. But again, people, the rare thing with Parkinson's is everybody's so different. So what happened to our journey doesn't mean it won't will happen to someone else's. Mm -hmm. Michael J. Fox has the external tremors, but my mother didn't. She had more internal. And then the dementia, hallucinations, and the uh, uh, delusions all set in, and that was something out of like a horror movie. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I know what that the creeping up of that disease could feel like because my mom also had Alzheimer's and was for 16 years and was um, diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And of course, you know, I stepped in like the superhero and said, we're going to fix this. We're going to get this, mom. Other people have, haven't, but we are. We're going to get this, you know. And then you start realizing it's bigger than you. And you don't know a thing about it, because why would, why would we, right? Why would you know anything about Parkinson's? I mean, unless you're thrown into it, it's not something that you're going to spend time in your life on. Um, and I like what you just said about, you know, the fact that, that your mom tried to, to underplay what was going on and not speak about it, because as did my mom, and as do a lot of uh, people with... with um, you know, progressive diseases, that it, 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 it feels to me, and I'd love to hear your perspective on it, it feels to me that my mom needed to do that, you know, and, and, and it was survival for her because while she was still fairly cognizant and copus mentis and really, you know, functioning in the world, to admit to that would be, would diminish the life that she was having at that time. And it would put a lot of stress on her in terms of the dignity, like you just said, right? And, um, and, and I also, and I'm going to let you take the floor, but I'm I just setting this up for you. Is I also felt like I needed to protect her dignity, which now in retrospect I realized that was me protecting me. I was, excited. Yeah, I was excited to join you today because one thing you mentioned is uh, unless you have Parkinson's or some of these illnesses that people, in a way, sadly don't care. But I, my dream, too, and goal is to reach people not just in the Parkinson's community and people not just diagnosed and caretakers not just uh, helping or aiding individuals with Parkinson's because the only way I feel we'll have a cure one day is if we can get everybody in throughout the world to join in and understand uh, as far as her, my mother was uh, kind of, she was always funny. Even doing this today, she would say, George, don't do it. Stay with your family. <laughs> so she always, she's very selfless and caring, loving. But I think part of her didn't want to burden us. I mean, I was working in law enforcement. I was an attorney and I have a PhD. So I was, you know, teaching around the country, doing my thing. My prior lifetime, as I say, it was I fought for victims' rights, so an advocate for victims' rights. So Again, not to get it too far, but I've always uh, saw the criminal justice system where the family members of victims are forgotten. So in a way, I kind of uh, calculate and look at the victims uh, or Parkinson's patients. Sometimes they're victims of the health care system. Because right now in the United States, we have no laws really helping fund or aid really research. And right now through Congress for the first time in uh, history in the U.S. There is a bill through the Mark, uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation's helping called End Parkinson's Disease Now. So I was really lucky enough to speak to my local representative and you too can and all of your uh, listeners and you can speak to your local representatives and try to help support the bill and it's bipartisan which is shocking that you know anyone would go against so it's all for Parkinson, but that would help with research and we were spending about like $12,000 a month just to have somebody watch over my mother uh, and they weren't really medically prepared and that's another interesting story we can talk about for caregiving but just because you're the caregiver doesn't mean you don't need also some hands-on help because I also had to work and have my family but I couldn't even leave her with these people because they weren't trained some didn't speak English some weren't qualified but it was so expensive that the normal person or family just can't afford that and that's not counting you know entertainment food and living so it's just another conversation that has to be uh, listened to well it's absolutely i mean that's why we're doing no country for old people the documentary because 
our system is, you know, wrought with, with ageism and ableism. And so, you know, the, the, those are our, our forgotten population, unfortunately, and, um, and easily dismissed because it's not, it's, it's pervasive everywhere. You know, in society, it's, unless you're touched by it, then, then, you know, it's very easy to fall into that, that perspective of ageism and ableism and that, you know, they're old, and they've had their life, and that's it, you know. And and it's okay. It's it's very dismissive, and 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 it's come. It what didn't used to be like that. It didn't, you know. And it's all been evolving with capitalism, and 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 it, it, you know, it's it's permeated everywhere, not just our country, but everywhere in countries that that have really maintained their their community based kind of, of uh, society, it's changing. It's changing everywhere because of, of money. And so, you know, you're, you're definitely, you know, absolutely on point on that. And it's something that is bigger than, than everything. It really needs to change. I mean, it has to change. It has to be a shift in the way we all think because whether you get Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or, you know, heart disease, whatever, whatever takes you down, which we will all be taken down at some point, we're still victims of the system, which is which is highly, you know, uh, it's dysfunctional, at best. What's also sad is my mother passed at age 69. So I've always dreamt mm. in my imagination and my mind that we all get a chance, you know, from 60 or 65 to like maybe 85 to relax. And she loves sitting on Sundays with her grandkids and you know blowing bubbles in the backyard and. Every time I walk by the backyard now, I, it saddens me because I think about how she was really robbed at that time. Uh, she never, she had a little money saved, and it was wiped out because of caring for Parkinson's disease. And, uh, you know, she just, we bought her a little beautiful home, a community away in South Florida, and we were just, I pictured her sitting for 10 years and just relaxing and looking back and being happy. And she only was at the house for one year, so we never even got... And that one year was a nightmare, so we never got that. I'm so sorry. Again, I mean, do you think that, I mean, when you say 69, to me that just seems, like, tragic and so sad. Yeah. But, but, but you think about, you know, when, you, when, the, when statistics come out about, you know, the elder community, it, it begins at 65, right? And, you know, it, we just can't, to me, we have to re, we have to re Re, reframe how we look at aging because 65, it's just, it, you know, just because I'm getting closer to it doesn't mean that you can't, that, that it doesn't mean I'm, I'm being sour grapes, but it means that I, you know, I have no intention of slowing down until I have to, right? It's a different world now. It's a different way that we take care of ourselves. We've extended our lives. So 69 is like the prime of your life, really, you know? And, and so, but it's still looked at as, as you know, the, as aged. And it's, and it's treated that way. I mean, you only have to look at COVID, during, during the height of it, when they were taking away, you know, deciding who was going to be vented and who wasn't. And there's laws to protect our diverse population. There's laws to protect our, um, our, dis our disabled population, but there was no laws to protect our elders. So they were the ones that suffered. What do you think about that? I mean, how, do, does that come into your conversation when you think about it because your mom was I mean she was taken out of this world too soon yeah as an attorney also I mean I always think about how uh, laws were not properly fit in many different ways even down to the topic of medical marijuana we have a, we had gotten a license from my mother because I thought if she's in horrible pain at least that would help but the distilleries don't speak to the patient or the doctor and it was a disaster so I felt like we mentioned earlier, every little step or hope that I had just didn't work out. And actually the reason I had to take over my mother's life and one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was a few, but one was t taking away her car keys because I couldn't allow her to drive because it was just a danger to herself and others. But she went for a special study because we were out of ideas uh, three years before she passed. And they, we think she might, they might have changed her medication too drastically. 
when she came home that night, she was kind of, uh, I f was called to rush over to her house at 4 a.m. and I found her uh, erratically and uh, moving her furniture out of her home because she thought someone was inside and was going to harm her. And I think it just really uh, caused her more, that's when the whole start, you know, the downfall began. And mm -hmm. they said she, uh, we saved her life that night, but I kind of selfishly feel that that was where it got, you know, maybe it wasn't good idea what we did, but obviously you can't look back on the past. You have to look to the future. But that another, that same night I had brought her to the hospital, went home, I hate telling the story, but I uh, went to get some of her clothing and I've never seen anything like it. It was almost like in one of those scary movies, but uh, throughout her room, she had post-it notes like we used to write notes and she wrote on the names, some of the dogs and family that she had to see if they were really there and who wasn't there. So she had lost a lot of the reality because of the dementia set in. Mm -hmm. And that was like one of the moments that just broke my heart forever. Even today, it's hard to talk about it, but I'm actually writing a book now where um, I'm not supposed to tell anyone, but I can't stop every time. <laughs> and it's gonna, it's gonna be about our journey through mine as a caretaker and my mother's yeah. throughout her whole life. Cause I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for my mother and her sacrifices. So. I'll be grateful forever, and uh, as we move forward together, when we talk, uh, together for Sharon.com, it's really just designed to, because when I was going through this, I was lost, so I thought if we could put all the resources I found in one place, maybe it would help one or two people, but I realized there's a million people in the U.S. with Parkinson's, but I discovered three months ago, four months, that uh, throughout the world, there's 10 million people, so I decided this is not just about me and my mother anymore, it's about everybody. So I've actually been a, had a great opportunity in the last three months. I'm kind of cutting back and stopping now, but I've interviewed 400 people around the world from uh, advocates to those diagnosed to caretakers. You can all find it on Together with Sharon. I do everything free. I do not allow people to donate money to us. We don't accept money. I, I just saw want, that. Yeah, uh, amazing. Uh, we actually, I've been lucky because it wasn't easy at first because who am I? I'm just some guy. Sometimes they think, you know, people sadly in, 2023 think you have to have something behind you know you have to have something you want or you're selling but no we're right. not. i want people to know in your audience that there are people who love and send our support no matter what and we don't want anything in return except a cure but i was able to have interviews in africa uh, asia france italy spain australia uh, i mean it's just amazing to be able to share because in africa it's called Parkinson's Africa. People think that they, it's witchcraft if you have Parkinson's, and it's very sad because they mm. don't get the right treatment because of that. And funding, but again, these are all so much to talk about that just have to limit it, obviously, for time. But again, I just uh, dedicate the rest of my life and I, uh, to helping others. But I, I mean, I can still get Parkinson's. They're not sure it's genetic or not. I think, honestly, it might have been something chemically because my mother lived in a home which was nice, but for 20 years, and they had like the termites, they had, this, you know, back then, pest spray was nothing, no one even right. cared what they sprayed. Uh, it's really frightening. And you chose to, because you, some people chose choose when they go through an ordeal like this to just say, that's it, I'm done, I'm moving on with my life. Was there, was there ever a moment you said, I, I need to separate, that from my, separate from this, or was it always like, no, I know what I need to do? I think that's an incredible question, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, it's funny, one of the nurses during the tough times for my mother, we had, we actually had long-term, which was a year hospice, because Parkinson's is not considered an end-of-life disease, but my mother had no other medical issue. Mm -hmm. That was very frustrating, but one of the nurses one night late and I said, they're amazed at me because most families, sadly, just send their loved one to a home, and they actually live in different states and they're never seen again, and I swore while my mother was able to understand and not understand that we would never do that. We'd always keep her in our own home. Even that got very difficult, though, because, mm -hmm. again, there were so many obstacles, whether it was uh, stomach uh, issues, whether it was, uh, you know, the medicines or the caretakers. I had to even put video cameras in our home because she felt the caretakers were harming her. Luckily, they weren't, but there was one we found was neglecting her because she didn't sleep very well. She was screaming. It's like haunting, but I have a video her yelling for help and nobody came. And that was mm -hmm. why I swore, because when you send your loved one to the home, you don't really know what's happening there. And obviously everyone's in a different position, so I can't ever judge anyone. I respect everyone, every family for what they have to go through. But I swore 
no matter what, the, we would at least be able to be with her until the end, and we were able to do that, even though it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But I think, yeah, I think, like, like you just said, we all choose different ways to, to deal with our own journey and our grief, you know, and I, for me, I do, I'm doing the same thing. I'm taking what I've learned and paying it forward. Because I also, you know, I think like you, because the journey was so long and they can be very long diseases that, you know, we learned a lot and we also need to, to, you know, really, really sort of get it out. We have a cathartic sort of, you know, uh, reckoning with all this, all this journey because it is so, I, 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 you, you talk about it, you know, like walking upstairs and then falling back down. I call it whack-a-mole because I couldn't keep up. You know, and just when I thought I conquered something, then another thing came up, and I had to conquer that, and I couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. At the end, you know, the last five, last six months of my mom's life was hell, and I couldn't keep up. And so, you know, on I had, you know, there's really no one to talk to, because yeah. every, you know, it's very difficult because you're trying to keep your loved one safe and also stay healthy yourself it's really hard so i understand what you went through is there what what can you what would you like to talk about that you because you've done so many interviews what what is something that you don't often get a chance to talk about that you feel that would be really you know helpful for others and yourself what what what, what would that be the reason I love your show is because it also talks a lot about caregiving. I'm in an odd world now, and I think about it sitting here even while we talk. Uh, I don't have Parkinson's, and my mother is no longer with us. So I'm kind of stuck in this. I'm not a caretaker now, and I'm not diagnosed. So sometimes I actually still feel alone. But when I get to interview or speak to individuals that have been diagnosed and work with foundations like the Parkinson's Foundation or the American Parkinson's Disease Association, and we do walks, it makes me feel a little hope and a little better. I, uh, we do walks for Parkinson's, uh, and we have a table where we just hand out like bands for free about awareness. But sometimes we're in the middle of all the pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> so people walk by and they're like scared to come to us because, they, again, they think we're selling. But then when they see about Together for Sharon and they come up to us, they cry and they thank us. And that's what really keeps me going. Uh, but I still, you know, again, learn a lot. I read a lot on this topic. So writing my book and our story is tough, too, because, it, like you were mentioning, it brings me back to those months and years that were very tough. I felt alone. But... I just want everyone to know they're never alone. They just have to know, you know, where that there are people like all three of us out there that uh, support them, and that, that's why we do what we do. I still wish there was more for individuals like myself who lost a loved one to Parkinson's, but that isn't really grieving or is still grieving because I've been to a few support groups, but again, it's for people going through it now or people who are diagnosed. So I still feel some days in my own kind of space, like forgotten. So I think uh, that's one area that might need to be improved. But uh, the only thing I look for again, because it's too late for our family, I don't want any other family to ever have to go through what my mother and I have. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, my, my mother, who's 89, she'll actually be 90 in two months, but she was diagnosed with Park low-level Parkinson's about uh, maybe three years ago. And they said, well, it probably won't progress. But they, they, I don't know how they know this, but they said it probably will not progress a lot. It'll probably stay kind of where it is. The thing is, as you said, everyone is different. Every, everyone is different. We never know with what she's going through, whether that is that the Parkinson's, is that old age, is that, you know, what is it? And it's so hard to address and, you know, we, you know, it's a, does the doctor know if that is – they could say, well, that could be – it's so hard to, to, to grasp it, especially at that level. Um, and, and because there's, there's so little that's consistent with each case, it's very difficult to navigate. And even with medications, when my mother passed, I mean, I had three garbage bags, big hefty black ones full of medicines. And I'm like, well, now here we go back to more questions. You know, she had – you know, diagnosed, fine, but which disease? Is it for the dementia? Is it for the Parkinson's? Right. Are the caretakers I'm leaving to 
watch over or giving them at the right time. They kept journal, but the people, I don't even know if they, again, understood Parkinson. Then is she getting too much of the medicine? Is she taking it the right, it was just like you, I think the example you used with the hitting the little, you know, thing on the head. Whack-a-mole. Whack yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, that sounds exactly what I felt like. And even now talking about it, I feel like that again, because, you know, it's just you don't have answers. You want them. You reach out, and you just feel helpless and alone as a caretaker. Mm -hmm. I was lucky to have a supportive wife, but the rest of my family, you know, they weren't able to help as much. So I was really with my mother, you know, most of the time. And I was just sitting there, and she would ask me, is this going to, you know, am I going to be able to see her her granddaughter, Brooke, you know, be at her wedding? And it broke my heart because I couldn't, I would never lie to my mother. So that's another thing. You should never, you know, give falsities or, you know, you want to care for them and kind of help them along. But I never lied to my mother. But not having the answer was even worse than, you know, kind of telling a fib or, you know, a lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever have PTSD after, basically, be, and, and if so, how do you deal with it? You know, this is for others who may, may be experiencing kind of the same thing. Uh, there's probably moments where you feel like you're almost back <laughs> it, because, you're, because it's still part of your life. It's such a huge part of your life. Mm -hmm. I think we all have that. I don't need, I don't think I need like a medication thing, but I think what helped, my medication is to go to the Sharon.com because, uh, like I said, my mission is that we have more awareness, speaking to amazing people like both of you. But it, this is even helping me cope. It's like my therapy session as we talk, and you've all brought out some incredible things that I didn't think about. That's why I love doing this. Uh, uh, we could talk for 20 hours. You won't want me back. There's so many uh, areas, and you know, we just never have the time. But even the short time together, again, can change the world. Even if we had just one person, I always say I'm one voice, one son, and one per, uh, individual, but together our uh, voices are just so much stronger. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, people have a, a, a misperception that, you know, that it's always the females that are caregivers, right? And so, and, and I know that that is not true, but, you know, we don't see as many men being out there and vocal and really presenting themselves. And I think it's really wonderful that you're doing that because um, I think it will uh, pave the way for other, you know, sons and husbands and brothers and, and you know, just the ma males to come out and, and really embrace that, that role of being a caregiver and be able to to speak to that to other males because you know it's generally thought of as a as a female sort of role and so i'm proud of you for that i think that's fantastic you know and when when you were talking about grieving i was thinking about the same with with alzheimer's because it's such a long disease and we don't we can't predict really when when it's going to end and because it's such a slow progression right then you start getting used to each stage. And so each stage, you, like I remember thinking, well, I'm so lucky because I can go and I can hold my mom's hand and I can get in and cuddle with her and still kiss her and love her up. I'm lucky I don't have to visit her at the cemetery. And even though, so every loss that she had, I kept telling myself, you're so lucky she's here. But there's that, that phrase, mm -hmm. you know, anticipatory grief that we experience while they're alive. And we keep, and it's a stress, it's a stress because you know it's going to happen at some point. But for me, and I'm assuming for you, it's, it's that feeling of like, this stage is going to last forever and, and until it doesn't. And, and so you grieve again, you grieve that loss. You keep grieving losses until when they finally leave the earth. It's, it's a very, for me, it was a very confusing phenomenon. Like I... I, I really thought I was going to lose it before it happened, and I was so much stronger than I thought I was going to be. And it's I like know the, that I haven't dealt with it. So, yeah, can you talk to that? Yeah, it's like an inner battle or struggle with yourself because, uh, again, you're trying to find uh, different... I didn't even know what five stages of Parkinson's was, but like you said, when we were at number one, I was trying to combat ever getting to number two. So right. the, you can't do that. And it was just like, uh, and every day there was something else. Like I finally had one relief maybe because she was okay for the minute, but then something else. Like we thought she had a stroke one day because she lost the ability to use part of her face and it was not stroke, but 
was just like uh, one thing after another. And writing the book now is kind of making me bring it back, which is not easy. I actually talked when I was going through the last year. I didn't dream it would be her final year, but I kept a little journal, just a handwritten one. I wrote notes, so that'll be incorporated. And I also videotaped and photographed, but I won't ever share the video or the pictures because I don't want her to be remembered like that. But I am going to share the journal, and it really is a raw footage, like, written of how I felt and how I was kind of screaming for help and nobody was responding. And it was, uh, you know, hopefully what I want people to, you know, I guess the book will be in the future. I won't talk much about it, but I want people to know, again, that they're not alone and that, uh, you know, maybe if they could learn one thing through our my struggle that it'll help them. And Because I really felt that there was no one out there who could help. We went to, like, seven or eight expert doctors. Uh, I had to pull the last doctor into an office by ourselves and say, is my mother going to live? Because she, I couldn't answer her, and he didn't even know. So just a horrible uh, situation for a caregiver and even more, obviously, for the individual uh, that's diagnosed. Yeah, I you think probably that's... probably recommend spe- not have... Oh, go ahead, Susan. No, I was yeah. going to say that speaks to the anticipatory grief that we experience because, you know, no one can tell us anything, you know, definite and it, that will give us some sense of of you know direction and and time frame so you know I, I always dread the dreaded calls you know that i would get like a call and, and my heart would beat and i'd go i'd let it go go to voicemail before i pick it up because i wanted to you know take a breath before because i was always fearing the worst and um and that's that's a that's a horrible place to live you know, um, always fearing the worst, right? Did you have that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we even, we had made a vacation with my family before we knew it was getting so bad. And the second I got on the plane from the second I went there, the second I got home, that she was calling 24-7, and I answered no matter what. But it was like, you know, I couldn't even have that one minute to myself. I used to be into personal training, fitness. I remember I played, like, competitive basketball for also for fun. And I would, I, one Sunday morning, I was all excited at 8 a.m. to go play with my friends and had all the gear on, which takes like, a long time because I've broken every body part by now. And uh, I, after I had, had it all ready to go, my mother called, and I dropped everything for myself to go help her. Even though I couldn't help her, I just wanted her to know I was physically there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and then there was a day, I hate telling some of these stories, where I was just sitting on the bed with my mother and my daughter. At the time, she was about six. My mother started hugging her, uh, like, one of the pillows, saying how much she loved Brooke, but she didn't realize that Brooke was next to her and it wasn't the pillow. She was hugging the pillow, and those things are just kind of heartbreaking. My daughter looked at me and I didn't know what to say, and that's another book I'm planning is to write a book about, you know, dealing with the grandparents and kids uh, when you, because I couldn't explain to my kids. There's a lot of things, again, I plan. Yeah. In retrospect, to, for, to help others, uh, would you recommend not taking the route of drop everything, don't take care of myself, because it's not healthy and it's not good for the person that you're caregiving for also. If you're unhealthy, if you're, you know, it, it's, you do have to, as the, you know, using the old adage, put your oxygen mask on first sometimes in order that you're healthy enough to take care of them. Would you kind of have a recommendation to people that, no, do take time for yourself, do keep yourself healthy, don't start, stop working out, because those are all making you less healthy mentally and physically, which is not a benefit to the person you're caregiving for. I think you make an amazing point again. Uh, I think each individual is different. So in my case, I would I would recommend people to definitely take a little time, maybe an hour a day, and just don't bring the phone. But the problem is, uh, like Susie was mentioning, I don't think I could do that because if something in that hour happened, I would never want to look back and regret it. That's my big thing is never look back and regret something. I and mean, we tried everything. So I know that in my heart, if we had to do it again, which I would, there's nothing I could have really changed because we don't have a cure. But, uh, you know, so uh, me personally, it's a bad advice, and I would just do the same thing. But you do have to try and make time to, or you'll lose your mind in a way. Because there were days where I felt like like the Wiley Coyote and the, you know, the Looney Tunes, like where yeah. just hitting me and I'm getting, but, uh, you know, I would fight back and win in the end. Because I feel like we did win, even though I, obviously I lost my mother. 
her story, I hope, will live on, not just for my time, but I'm going to hopefully my daughter will continue this. And, you know, I mean, I'm hoping we'll have a cure before that. But if yeah. not, I, I want this to go on until we do. I don't want anyone out there to think they're alone. And the, the fun, the nice thing is when uh, I do publish the interviews, like every day there's a new one, done 365, there's many more we're working on. But when, every day a new one comes up, it's like a new story to tell. And it just makes my heart feel better because knowing that, you know, one more person has a place now to share their journey. And that's what, again, keeps me motivated and going. That, that is a beautiful thing. That's, I feel the same way with this show is that, you know, that we, the more stories that we share, you know, the, the, that is, that is the, the penicillin for, for caregivers right now or other people's stories because we, if we can see ourselves in other people's stories, then we don't feel alone, right? And so it, it does make you feel so supported and validated for the choices that you make. I mean, that's why we did our movie, My Mom and the Girl, you know, really showing what it, the day in the life of, you know, and, and so that, and I think for us, I know for us, you know, hearing people come up to us and, or getting letters, to this day we did this film six years ago, you know, this film is my life. You said you told my story, and it's not their story, but it is because it's it's the emotion and um and it's and that's that's all we can do is to share our stories that's the most powerful thing we have and so what you're doing is 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 for me the perfect thing you're doing is you know what you're doing honoring your mom and and paying it forward with everything you've learned and giving a safe space for people to to um express their stories is it's the highest thing you can do as a caregiver. And so, you know, I know that both Dawn and I feel very, you know, excited for you and happy for you that you're doing this and happy for other caregivers out there that they have a place to go, you know, and specifically for Parkinson's. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's a gift. Yeah, the only thing that still breaks my heart is the one journey that I'm not aware of because there are people out there and I just might not know about them. I always encourage people to reach out anytime, 24-7, and if you know someone, even both of you, I have, I can send you the information, because you both have amazing stories to share, and I also like keeping the memory of your loved ones alive forever, but, uh, you know, and then there's a, f luckily out of maybe 500, 400, two or three just uh, didn't want to, but those are the ones that really kind of make me upset, too, because it's, uh, I just want them to be remembered. Like, let, and I understand someone diagnosed. Obviously, it's privacy, and I'm for that. But the organizations, there's one. I, I think it was out of the U.S. that said they're not into that. I'm like, <laughs> the whole purpose of what you're doing is what we're trying to do: share, you know, and get help them fundraise. Like, I don't want to, but you always have, you know, one or two in every field and things. But the, again, the one individual or organization that kind of hurts is the one that doesn't want the short uh, story told or the one that I just am not aware of. The other day, quick story is uh, I actually met someone who Instagrammed me and I didn't even know because you get, you know, you know, you have so many. I, I'm, it's just me. Like, this is not a foundation. It's just one guy like me who lost a mother and loved one. Uh, but uh, so I was able to reach out to them. And in one day, I pushed their story forward. He's a lawyer. He, law, you know, he's fighting with the same issues in the Parkinson's field, and uh, just uh, it was really fascinating. They started their own little organization, uh, and it's just uh, fascinating. And he's very small, so by me putting up, it's up right now, their story uh, that you know maybe it'll help them fundraise for Team Fox and Michael J. Fox Foundation. But those are the little things that again just uh, make mean the world to me is really sharing other people's journey and. Uh, in helping them too. Yeah, Wonderful. but it's so important because, you know, if if we, you say some people, you know, it's a, it is a private thing and it definitely yeah. is, but the more we we just put it out there, it removes the stigma of it. And I think because and then they're the therefore the fear and therefore, you know, it opens us up to to, you know, when and again, this comes back to telling your stories that that's you know, if we keep it in the shadows, it's never going to progress, you know, where the, the, so, you know, for, for people to, and, and therefore like Michael J. Fox, 
there's nobody who could put himself more out there than him. Okay. This is, you know, somebody who knew, the public knew before, and now, and, and that's why it's so important. So what you're doing is, you know, just a huge, huge kudos, because, you know, you're allowing, a, you, you're allowing that, uh, you know, a platform for these people. So yeah. bravo to you. Yeah, I think telling our mistakes that we've made as caregivers can mm -hmm. alleviate the any stress that other caregivers are having now, like you and I are are not currently caregivers, and we probably will be again okay. at some point. But right now we're not, so we can take that information that we've learned. Like I always, I'm very, very transparent about the mistakes I made in the beginning with my mom and, and how, you know, I, I learned and um, decided to embrace her disease as best I could because that was the right thing to do. And, but it took me a while, and, you know, I put, put it in the documentary where, you know, it makes me cringe sometimes to think about the mistakes I made. But that's okay because that's how we learn, and I can maybe, with, with, by telling it like you're doing, we can, we can alleviate any stress that someone may be going through right now or, or you know, be able to... to have them skip that step, you know, okay. and not have to go through it and be frustrated. So that that's why it's really valuable. Um, is there anything else that you would want to talk about? No, I mean, I really, we... no, I really appreciate the time. And I just happen to have this up. I don't know if you can see, but tomorrow I have a story about, uh, it's Linda and Keith Hall from Parkinson's Fitness. It's a fan, uh, husband and wife who started uh, doing a little bit of uh, organization for fitness for individuals with Parkinson. One thing I didn't really know, and my mother kind of was too late, was fitness uh, is really important because Parkinson's a neurological disorder, and we didn't get a lot of time to talk about that. But uh, if you can do fitness like this, punching for Parkinson's, this walking for Parkinson's, the dancing for Parkinson's, I've been able to really uh, interview all these individuals around the world and there's even ping pong for Parkinson's. I never knew how many things there were. <laughs> so I tried to bring them all on my page just so you can see. But if you go through all the interviews, it's just uh, fascinating to see how Parkinson's can affect a family. But instead, like you said, instead of just living with it and keeping down and quiet, they're all trying to do their best to fight back. So the next book I'm planning after the journey of my mother and my, uh, myself as a caretaker is going to be publishing all the interviews. So I've got approval from everyone who I interviewed. So there's a lot of amazing things coming. And I just, you know, stay tuned. I really thank you both for your time. And again, I feel like we've become family in just a short time. And <laughs> your, your time means the world. And I've had some great opportunities. I was able to interview Muhammad Ali's daughter. I've uh, spoken to some really incredible, famous celebrities, which is great because you want them involved because they have more uh, awareness. Some of them don't respond, but that's because I'm just me. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> uh, it's hard. I've even written to, uh, you know, again, there's just so much to talk about. I've written to 15 politicians, didn't really get any response, which is hard, sad because we yeah. need them involved. But the, and I've written to newspapers who will cover other things, but not Parkinson's. And didn't get any responses, but I'm the type of person, if you come to know me, that won't give up, and uh, there's a good reason for it. It's just I want more people, again, to be aware like we started, and that I feel if we had individuals more aware that we would already have a cure. So again, uh, you know, everyone listening, thank you for your time. There's people like me out there who send our love and support again, and I'm grateful. Thank you both. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for for doing what you're doing in such an altruistic, open, you know, very generous way. And um, I'm glad that we finally got to do this. Together for Sharon is an amazing uh, resource. Please go and check it out. You know, if you if you haven't, please do. Please, and if you have a wonderful story to tell, please, you know, reach out to George. He's so, he's so you know, amenable and just, you know, a, a, a human being, a mensch, as they say in French. And so, um, <laughs> and I, and I, I promise I've been called you, worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've gotten very Jewish now that my mom's died. I, I like taking it on. Yeah, I've embraced my, my Jew-ishness. So anyway, <laughs> and, um, but I think that you are. You are definitely, my mother would say, you're such a mensch, and um, your mom, you know, you're doing well by your mother. I know your mom's proud of you. We're proud of you. And really take advantage, you guys, of this, of this wonderful resource and, a, and also an outlet and a platform to tell your story about 
Parkinson's and your your journey with it. We really thank you for coming on today and um, you know, I'm wishing you the best of luck and you'll come back again and when you get your book done. I love we'll that. talk about your book. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck, George. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm-hmm.